Just like Attack on Titan and other such anime where the mangaka doesn't have an attachment to his main cast, Jujutsu Kaisen shocks us with countless deaths. Like there is literally too many for me to go over every single life form inside of the story. From your most beloved characters to the ones you hate, you'll be left confused not knowing who's going to drop next. This list will make you cry and laugh at the same time while being shocked with the sheer multitude of people who are erased from the Jujutsu Kaisen universe. Just how many deaths did take place in Jujutsu Kaisen? Well, there is a lot, so sit back and relax as I also decided to bring in a multitude of my favourite Jujutsu Kaisen YouTubers to help me out with this ridiculous list. If you do want similar content just like this, where I'm going to bring a bunch of people on from different series to discuss moments throughout those series, then smash that like button so that I know you want more and subscribe if you are new around here. But as I just said, sit back and relax as we get into the first chronological death in Jujutsu Kaisen. Normally people uh, die and get buried, but Rika Orimoto got hit by a car and turned into a vengeful cursed spirit. Rika appeared in Jujutsu Kaisen Zero, a prequel to the original story. She is Yuta Okotsu's beloved childhood friend and someone who never truly left the story, even though the movie kind of made it seem that way. As I said, Rika Orimoto died in a horrifying car accident, becoming a spirit and eventually transforming into a special grade curse spirit called the Queen of Curses. Although Rika had spent years haunting Yuta, after Yuta joined Tokyo Jujutsu High, he learned several ways to unravel curses that finally allowed Rika's spirit to rest in peace. Suguru Geto is honestly a fantastic character who sadly has one of the biggest downfalls inside of the series. He goes from a charismatic man who would lay his life on the line for anybody, to a narcissistic dude who looks down on anyone he considers below him. Geto seems to hold strong feelings of hatred for non-sorcerers to the extent of mass murdering hundreds of civilians in a single night. Because of his outrageous behavior and twisted morals, Geto got expelled from Jujutsu High and was titled to be the worst curse user of all time. While normal people get expelled for using alcohol or bringing weapons, in anime, you get expelled for exterminating an entire village, which is fair? Anyways, in the final moments of the cursed child arc, Geto unleashed chaos by releasing cursed spirits and declaring war on the Jujutsu Sorcerers. In a climactic battle, he faces off against Yuta Kotsu, but is ultimately defeated and later killed by Gojo Satoru. But his body is reanimated by an unknown entity, leading to a new Geto emerging with enhanced powers. The shocking death of Geto marks a pivotal moment in the Jujutsu Kaisen storyline. Thank you Big Zonin, and like, having gone over all of the important deaths from throughout Jujutsu Kaisen Zero, we move forth into the original storyline of Jujutsu Kaisen. First up, we have the old G himself, a man drenched in mystery and one hell of a cool grandpa, Wasuke Itadori, also known as Yuji's grandfather. From very early on, it was shown that Gramps cared about Yuji more than anyone, and the same went for Yuji, like man's moral compass revolves around something his grandfather said extremely early on in the series. On that day, as he lay in bed, and a few moments before his death, Gramps probably thought to himself that it was sad he wasn't surrounded by many people. Speaking up, he advises Yuji to help people whenever he could and to not be like him when he dies. Moments later, Wasuke Isidori passes on inside of the hospital. Yo, 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 hold your horses, dear Volo. Before we go any further, I've got to thank the big dogs themselves, Raid Shadow Legends, for sponsoring this video. Raid is a turn based RPG game which is both free and available on mobile and PC. Pretty much, you assemble a team of yoked out champions, develop their skills by getting better sets of armor and weapons, then use them to go up against other online players or challengers. Because I'm a massive world building nerd in general, the fact that these guys have over 700 unique characters who the majority of have like in-depth backstories that allow someone like myself to lose themselves in is frankly amazing. My favorite, if I had to choose one, would be the gorgeous high elf, Elaine. Her backstory is definitely one of the more intrepid and goes into the interesting dynamic inside of the High Elven Monarch Society, as she is considered someone who might one day become queen. So if you want to click my link and join up, currently new players can get their hands on the Stag Knight, one of the best epic champions around, as well as a skin for him designed by Jontron. So after you click my link down below to play Raid, use the promo code JTSKIN before October the 7th. Of course, if you already do jam Raid, you can still get Stag Knight and the skin through an in-game event. Then on top of that and until like the 23rd of October, Raid takes on the Monkey King from Chinese mythology, Sun Wukong, who has been introduced as a legendary champion. All you have to do to get him is log in on 7 random days between now and the 23rd of October to get him for free. 
With all of this exciting stuff and more coming to Raid in the future, if you haven't started playing yet, then what are you even waiting for? Use my link down in the description below or scan my QR code on screen to get insane bonuses. We're talking an epic champion, Knight Errant from the Banner Lords faction, and a bunch of other useful things that you, you just need to get started in the game. But anyway, back to Giga absolutely destroying our souls with all of the deaths throughout Jujutsu Kaisen. Now, I probably should mention this because it really does matter in the grand scheme of things, but Yuji Itadori's temporary death. I know you were wondering, what? Yuji Itadori's death? Like, but just trust me on this one. We obviously know it all happened, and Yuji's first death did happen when Sukuna got a hold of his body right after our boy swallowed one of the fingers inside of the juvenile detention center. Remember when Man literally ripped out Yuji's heart just to taunt Megami who was standing in front of him? Well, initially, we all thought Yuji would die instantly. However, it was revealed that his mind still existed within the confines of his body's inner world. There, and in an area that kind of resembles Sukuna's domain, Yuji confronted him, determined to punish Sukuna for all that he's done. Stopping our boy in his tracks though, Sukuna proposes a deal to fix Yuji's heart, more specifically under a binding vow. Now I'm slightly off track on this whole video and everything here, but this is important in the grand scheme of things. Listen to the conditions offered by the almighty Sukuna. If Sukuna is able to beat Yuji in a battle here, the first one includes being able to use his body as a host whenever he wants but he isn't able to hurt anyone, anyone at all, during that one minute. And the other is that he has to forget the conversation that happened between the two of them here. Yuji, thinking that he can somehow like win, decides to throw hands while agreeing with Sukuna's conditions. However, in a fraction of a second, Yuji gets one shot and because of the conditions, he doesn't even remember this moment. Next up, Nagi Yoshino, also known as the Waifu Mummy, or Junipei's mother. After dinner inside of the Yoshino household, Nago falls asleep on the table only to wake back up and find this weird looking finger that was placed by a certain someone in front of her. It's unfortunate that she literally woke up only to sleep again for eternity. It turns out that a cursed spirit had been lurking around Sukuna's finger, which after she picked it up and went to her room, well, yeah, you can imagine what happened from there on out. Crazy thing is that like because her passing included cursed spirits, her death is not officially included in civilian documents, but in Jujutsu High's documents it's reported that her body was found with its lower half missing and that it's laid out inside the bedroom with some cold packs and ice all around it. Obviously it's one messed up scene that we know Junipei stumbled across and of course not so surprisingly like mother like son. Right after the death of his mother, Junpei Yoshino sadly became Mahito's next prey. Junpei Yoshino, one of the students at Satozakura High School, became friends with our main character Yuji. However, before they became friends, Junpei fell for Mahito's dirty, passive-aggressive tricks. The dude was literally playing with his mind. Mahito did save Junpei from the bullies one time, but little did he know the consequences that would evolve from this incident. Well, his fate was surely a sad one. I remember how the anime played us all for a fool by including him in the opening where wearing Jujutsu High clothes, only to go and take him out an episode later. Before that happened though, and during the clash between Junpei and Yuji, a sneaky someone strolled down some steps and completely changed the scape of the story for our MC. Of course, the malevolent Mahito who'd been lurking around the school showed up in the middle of a conversation between Yuji and Junpei, only to transform the unsuspecting Junpei with his idol transfiguration. Sadly, Junpei turned into some weird transfigured monster that after a few moments tragically collapsed at Yuji's feet. For ages, after his passing, everyone was wondering what could have happened if Junpei hadn't died and stayed with the sorcerers, as his ability with that jellyfish thing was pretty freaking sweet. To be honest, this is also why I think Jujutsu Kaisen is that good, because it doesn't have only one or two massive character deaths. Instead, Gege is so freaking wild that by the time the manga ends, the only one left over might just be Yuji. It's wild because you can never expect your favorite character to be safe, and always need to expect the unexpected. Thank you Anime Anxiety for taking the reins on that one. Next up we've got Kachizu, one of the two blood brothers on the list. Having been sent out on a mission to retrieve one of Sukuna's fingers, Kachizu along with his brother encountered Yuji and Nobara at the Yosuhachi Bridge. Engaging in an intense battle with the duo, Kachizu attempted to use his blood manipulation powers in combination with his brother Iso. However, once injured by Nobara's Black Flash, the weakened curse tries to lash back out, but was subsequently taken out by Nobara's lethal hairpin. Just before that happened though, Yuji had used his black flash to blow off Iso's arm. After seeing Kachizu injured by the same technique, Iso hopes that his brother is still somehow alive. However, he soon senses that Kachizu had died and apologizes to Choso that he wasn't able to save their brother. 
Suddenly, a random flatbed truck drives past them, and knowing that he probably isn't strong enough to take down the two Jujutsu sorcerers, Iso takes his chance to grab the car and take a hostage to cement his safety. As the car drives away, Iso plans to heal himself and get revenge on Yuji and Nobara for killing his brother. But as he looks over to where Kichiso is, he notices Nobara and wonders what in the world she could possibly be doing. Well, Nobara of course, she was using nothing other than her resonance technique on the arm that Yuji had severed previously to inflict damage to Iso, causing him to fall off the car from its effects. In that moment, Yuji took the opportunity to end the helpless cursed womb's life. Moving on to the next death, we've got Riko Amanai, one of the students at Renshoko Girls Junior High and the Star Plasma Vessel for Tengen's merger in 2006. Honestly, episode 3 of season 2 and pretty much season 2 overall is really, really good. Like, it's crazy how good this is. And Riko's death is handled so, so well. So, the tragic event occurred when Riko got attacked by the soldiers of Q while waiting for Suguru Ghetto and Satoru Gojo. After being rescued by Ghetto and Gojo, Riko joined them in their mission to protect and safeguard Tengen, a powerful cursed object known as the Star Plasma Vessel. However, the enemy captured Riko's friend Misato during their journey, leading to a rescue operation in Okinawa. After successfully saving Misato, Riko and Ghetto head further into the tomb to find Tengen. In the tomb's main chamber, Riko expressed her desire to be with everyone instead of merging with Tengen, and tragically, she got shot in the head by Toji Fushiguro, leading to her death. It's not so much surprising, but it is really sad, and it does tie into why why Ghetto became such a creams, I mean racist, and why he became so disillusioned with the sorcerer world. Thank you, my uh, my freak of a friend Busham Zero for taking that. Now I, I I hope you have fun editing this video and don't do anything crazy to me for just calling you a freak there. But you know you are a VTuber, so it you know I don't know. I just anyway. Toji, or should I say my dad and the hottest villain in the history of anime? Wait, maybe I'm more of a freak. Yes. I, either way, he's he's one hell of a remarkable character who's caused a bunch of tragedies and is the strongest non-sorcerer entity in the entirety of Jujutsu Kaisen, bar possibly Maki now. During the final moments of the mission for the Time Vessel Association, instead of escaping, Toji notices that the Gojo he was sure he killed earlier stood right in front of him. In one of Toji's biggest L's of the entire series, he decides to stay and fight. Of course, he literally decimated Gojo the first time around, so you can't entirely blame him for wanting to stick around here and do it again. Still, this time he allowed his hatred for Jujutsu sorcerers to get the best of him. Sadly, and as we all have bared witness to now in the anime, Gojo came back absolutely cracked out of his mind and used a fusion of both of his limitless techniques. Using a mixture of blue and red, Gojo created for the first time in his life, Hollow Purple, a devastating ability that erases anything from existence in its path. Blasting forth, and almost at a point blank range, Toji's left side of his body is utterly annihilated, leaving him there completely perplexed with the decisions that drove him to this end. But, you know, Gege wasn't done at that point, he wanted to spaz with Toji just a, just a little more, and after reincarnating throughout the middle of the freaking Shibuya incident arc, which you're gonna get again, like I can't wait until we see this part animated, Toji only has one thing on his mind, and that is to destroy the strongest opponent he can find. After beating Eno to a pulp and ending an old hag's existence, Toji bursts into Dagon's own domain and obliterates the special great curse in a matter of moments, who, by the way, was on the very verge of taking out a bunch of sorcerers. Then, like, like man was on demon time when he got reincarnated, he started a fight in a battle against his own son, who doesn't even realize, like, it's his dad right here. Like, oh my lord, this stuff was so insane, and after almost taking out his son a few times throughout that small battle, he manages to somehow get a hold of his body. Stopping it in like this uh, alleyway for a moment, he asked his son what his name was. And when Megumi said Fushiguro, Toji, without a single second of hesitation, stabbed himself in the head with a playful cloud, ending his reincarnation. Even though, like, we might not expect empathy or compassion from Toji, just due to who he was in general. Him realizing that his son took his name and was probably raised by Gojo, like Gojo, like he asked Gojo in his last seconds, gave him enough faith that he didn't need to be around any longer, and that's why I think he did what he did here. But maybe, you know, like with all the current happenings with Megami in the manga, if dude does come back now, which is extremely unlikely, he would actually have a reason to stick around and save his boy's soul. But that's just, you know, like that's one of Noop's theories, and you know, he's, he's a little bit mental that when I give him that. 
But next up, we've got the previous generation, Yuji Itadori, Yu Hayabara, who, in my eyes, is like Junipei, but cooler because he almost gets to save Ghetto with Talk No Jutsu. Yu Hayabara might be one of the minor characters who we only got a few moments of or like panels from in general, but he truly played a crucial role in building the character development of Kento Nanami and Ghetto. Sometime after the events that happened with the Star Plasma Vessel, like I think this was around a year later, correct me if I'm wrong here, the anime episode hasn't come out yet, <laughs> you and Anami were given a mission to take out a low ranking cursed spirit, however everything went wrong. It turned out that the info they were given about the cursed spirit was dead wrong, and with it having taken a role as a kind of deity in the village, it grew in power, becoming at least a grade 1 threat, which eventually, you know, took out you. We don't know how it happened, but losing his close friend hits the Nami hard, and he's never the same again. He drops the whole Jujutsu Sorcerer gig and becomes your average office worker after he loses faith in the Jujutsu society. To a lesser extent, this also happens as well with Ghetto, but obviously he doesn't drop out, he just loses faith. Yu was like definitely the Yuji of the year and just brought brightness to those dark times, so to see him pass shrouded Ghetto in even more darkness. Skipping away from the Gojo past arc now and during the events that lead up to the Shibuya incident arc, Kokichi Muta had done it dirty on our main group and for an unspecified time in secret was teamed up with the Manases of the series. This technically wasn't because he wanted to betray everyone so you have to understand that, like Kokichi's character will grow with you guys and it grew with me throughout this arc profoundly, like just stick yourselves in his shoes for a second and imagine being crippled your entire life, never being able to touch your friends without excruciating pain, then an offer through a binding vow to become whole again, an offer to finally be there to help your friends came up, one that would 100% work, would you shy away from that or would you take it? Well, this was the inner conflict that Kakechi dealt with for a while, and after fulfilling the conditions of the binding vow and gaining a healthy body for the first time in his life, he put his new life on the line to try and save his friends before the main event of Shibuya. This whole fight was like absolutely amazing and you gotta check out my highlights channel if you want to watch all the fights individually without searching through an 8 hour long banger of a video. But there, at the dam, Kakichi uses his ultimate Mikamaru puppet to blow everything to bits and was planning to help by letting Gojo know about the plan they had set for him in Shibuya. However, it didn't take long for Mahito to get the upper hand throughout the battle. He uses his domain expansion and after some insane uses of simple domain, which by the way he wasn't even meant to know this technique, like he actually learns it in secret which is super dope, Kokichi sadly bites the dust and is ultimately transfigured by Mahito. Still, we aren't exactly privy to those final moments, so man must have been annihilated in some terrible off-screen kill. Instead, all we see is the ultimate Mikamaru Gundam slumped over the dam. Moving forward into the Shibuya incident arc, Hanami, along with a bunch of the other cursed goons, unfortunately crossed paths with Gojo, resulting in an intense battle in which we lose the genderless tree. Upon encountering Gojo Satru, it becomes clear that defeating the strongest sorcerer of all time is no simple task because he is literally him. Man is on a completely different level when it comes to hands, and nothing the four curses throw at him seem to work at all. In the end, Gojo tricked Hanami into removing his domain amplifier by making him think he had accidentally deactivated his cursed technique. Not even realizing the mistake of their ways, Hanami goes to use his cursed power, but Jogo tells Hanami to not deactivate his amplification. Suddenly, Gojo grabs a hold of the branches on Hanami's head and pulls them out, severely weakening the cursed spirit. Chozo from nearby manages to distract Gojo for a fraction of a second, allowing his teammates to dive in for an attack. However, Gojo uses this moment to his advantage and as he activates his curse technique, he crushes the weakened Hanami up against the wall. You already know that Jalamoth had to cover the insect characters that Gege's blessed us with, starting with the Grasshopper Curse, the smartest character in Jujutsu Kaisen. He's right! Being all of Japan's sphere of locusts and grasshoppers pulled into one being, Mahito gave him the oh-so-important job of protecting the curtain. While Yuji and him do have a pretty thrilling back and forth between two arms and four arms, he doesn't even get a single hit on Yuji before being off screened by the demon god. So thank you uh, Jello and Big Fake Wee for taking those two, but now we got the old hag herself, Ogami, a sorcerer and assassin who could shapeshift people and maybe even herself using her curse technique. But tragedy struck when her grandson's soul fell under the dominance of no one other than Toji Fushigiro's domineering spirit. Atop one of the buildings in Shibuya, Toji unleashed his wrath on poor Ogami, calling her an old hag and delivering a devastating punch that ultimately blew through any defense they thought they had. 
defenseless against his onslaught, Ogami met her untimely fate and died there. Next up, we've got Naji Abina, who is, is probably one of the characters you easily forget the name of. But during the Shibuya incident arc, Niji emerged as one of the allied cursed users under Suedo Gido's command. The intense clash between Niji and Mei Mei, who's actually an insanely skilled Shiutsu sorcerer, unfolded when Niji, accompanied by a formidable cursed spirit, confronted her and her team in the heart of Shibuya. As the battle escalated between the two, Mei Mei's unyielding assault pushed Niji into a state of desperation, causing blood to stream from his nose. Despite Niji's pleas for mercy, Mei Mei sternly questioned his comprehension on the value of life. Having listened to his reply and immediately becoming dissatisfied with his feeble response, she struck a fatal blow, abruptly terminating the clash and snuffing out this dude's life. Next up, Dagon is one of those unregistered special grade cursed spirits who have joined hands with Mahito Jogo and Hanami. What's different about this man is that you often see the squad actually hanging out in his domain expansion, Horizon of the Captivating Skander. Due to his overconfidence and belief in himself, Dagon underestimated humans a little too much, which resulted in his tragic death at the hands of no one other than Big Daddy Toji Fushiguro. So after reviving through Ogami's seance technique, as I've like been over before, Toji only sought one thing, and that was the destruction of anyone who he considered strong. Throughout the like landscape of Shibuya and most likely finding a partially formed hole on the ground outside of Dagon's domain, which by the way was currently in use against the plethora of Jujutsu High Sorcerers, Toji made his magnificent reappearance. Falling into this foreign world, Toji within a few milliseconds changes the utter outlook of this previously fleeting battle. Due to how Toji was reanimated, he immediately went up the strongest around, human or curse, and of course, this happens to be the special grade demon, Dagon. Dagon, till his last breath, tried to resist his unfortunate fate, claiming that the battle is not over until it's over. Toji though, isn't held down by the chains of fate. Before Maki even realized what had happened, Toji stole his special grade weapon, Playful Cloud, sharpened both of its points as if it was a plain stick, and exercised Dagon in one brutal display of dominance. Diving out of the domain now though, Naobito Zenin, the head honcho of the Zenin family and Naoya's dad was a total badass special grade 1 Jujutsu sorcerer. His curse technique is focused on projection sorcery where he divides one second into 24 frames where anything it touches must abide by a 24 FPS rule or it will get frozen for one second inside the animation frame. On that fateful October the 31st and literally right after Toji took out the god, before they could even catch their breath, Jogo showed up and tragically ended Naobito's life as he was burned to a crisp in a matter of seconds. There's been some hectic deaths, I'd love to know your thoughts on like all of the deaths that have happened throughout the series so far and the stuff that we've got to come throughout Shibuya. As next up, Mimiko and Nanako Hasaba, the twins with innocent faces but much more deceiving personalities. Throughout the heart of Shibuya, like this is definitely where we are first graced with the god-given talent of Gege Akutami to physically break our souls. Gojo, who got sealed a little while back, was really only a front to the true destruction of what is to come here. With Yuji lying helpless on the floor after a succession of battles he was in himself, the girls find and begin feeding him a finger in order to revive Sukuna. So, you see in their eyes, if they revive Sukuna, they can use his body to help take out the body swapper and get Gedo back. So, as the two start to feed Yuji Sukuna's fingers, Jogo randomly shows up as well. Instantly, and following the destructive path that Jogo was just on with everyone else, he takes care of them in a moment and continues to feed Sukuna some more fingers. To be exact, I think he had like 11 of them or something? Anyway, anyway, Nanako manages to heal the two and they prepare to fight Jogo themselves. But suddenly, Sukuna awakens while telling Jogo to move. Standing above the girls as they bow terrified on the floor, Sukuna asks what they want since they did feed him a finger. Hearing that they want to use him to free their trapped master though, he takes offense and decides to end them. First, he tells the girls to raise their heads though. Then, with a cheeky grin on his face, he takes Nanako by surprise as he obliterates Mimiko who was sitting right next to her. Shocked with what just happened, Nanako tries to pull out her phone to fight back, but before she's even able to take a picture, she too is vaporized from existence by Sukuna's cleave technique. Driven by a shared desire among many cursed spirits, Jogo sought the destruction of humanity. Envisioning a world where cursed spirits ruled, he was the reason Naobito Zenin died and why Nanami and Maki got severely injured in the Shibuya incident arc. However, his grand dreams were tragically cut short when he came across Sukuna, the king of curses. Jogo, unlike Mimiko and Nanako, didn't ask Sukuna for any favors and only told him to try to take over Yuji's body permanently. Sukuna refused and revealed he had his 
own plans, confusing and surprising Jogo. As an appreciation for the fingers, Tsukuna agreed to throw hands with the special grade curse, and if he lost, then he would follow his plans instead. Jogo willingly engaged with Tsukuna in the hopes of recruiting him, knowing full well he could die in the process. As the two titans fought, Jogo was heavily outclassed by Tsukuna and was once again forced to realize his own weakness, frustrating him throughout the fight. In the end, while the two stood atop Jogo's Maxim Meteor, Tsukuna showed him something that we still barely have any knowledge on in the series, the Black Box. And after opening this box and creating some form of hellish fire in his palm, Tsukuna shoots it forth, utterly annihilating the special grade curse from reality in a fraction of a second. One minute he's standing on top of Maximum Meteor in Shibuya, then the next he is strolling through the afterlife, as if he's been there for hundreds of years. Appearing himself in this otherworldly area, Tsukuna believed Jogo was foolish for wanting to take the place of humans. He told Jogo that flocking together and comparing yourself to those around you stunts true growth and that Jogo should have burned everything he desired to cinder without a second thought. Even still, Tsukuna admitted that their fight was fun for him, stating that Jogo stood out amongst those he had fought in the last thousand years, encouraging the cursed spirit to stand proud because he was strong. This acknowledgement of his strength made Jogo so proud that he shed tears for the first time in his short life, completely unaware he was even capable of crying. Sorry guys, I didn't have uh, enough breath after Mimiko and Nanako got wiped from existence there, so I had to let old big BR take the reins for a second. Come but next up, we literally have everyone's favorite character in the entirety of the Jujutsu Kaisen universe, Luck Incarnate, Haruta Shigimo. Okay, you yeah, know, I'm obviously joking. Stuff this man, he's like an actual disease and he's probably my least favorite character or the one I hate the most, kind of like Joffrey from Game of Thrones. He's on like that level of hate, which is a good thing for characters. And anyway, still on October the 31st in Shibuya, things got seriously intense for Haruta. He proved why he's in my eyes more hated than even Mahito. Following the orders of the mysterious Arume who just showed up randomly throughout this part of the story, Haruta launched a full on attack on the assistant managers who were helping the Jujutsu sorcerers. But guess what, after doing this, he ended up crossing paths with no one other than the fierce and determined Nobara, who was accompanied by the badass manager Hakari Nita. Sadly, and mainly because Shigemo is actually an average sorcerer, he was able to get the upper hand on the two ladies. Just before he was finished strike down on one of them though, our big G, Nanami, suddenly arrived and beat him to a pulp. However, and I guess because of this dude's luck ability, he somehow survived this absolutely insane beatdown. After he eventually woke back up, Haruta's path unexpectedly crosses with Megami Fushiguro, who, in a moment of utter desperation, summons Maharaga to defeat him. Sukuna, who had just won his nearby battle against Jogo, notices that freaking Maharaga was summoned and decided to stroll over to fix the situation. Having shown up and blitzed Maharaga in a matter of moments himself, Sukuna chucks the wheel aside and watches it disintegrate, which also signifies the conclusion of the exorcism ritual, and that there, I can tell you, has some massive roles to play later on in the story. Anyway, seeing Shigemo in the vicinity, he tells the curse user to be gone, prompting Shigemo to flee in joy. However, he was not safe from malevolent shrines effects like Megami was, and because this dude ran the wrong way, well, Taking him by surprise with a delayed effect, Shigemo's body slides apart, having been completely sliced in half by Sukuna's cleave. Ah, uh, next up, we've got a, uh, we've got something else here, boys. Nanami, may your soul rest in peace, my good friend. Nanami is undoubtedly one of the most cherished characters in Jujutsu Kaisen, capturing fans' hearts with his incredible ability to ratio the absolute fuck out of anyone he comes across. Like the dude is literally the reason this channel exists to start with. If I wasn't stuck in a terrible job at a time and didn't vibe with this dude's personality, I probably would still be laying concrete like I used to back in the past. So, when I first read ahead into Shibuya after season 1, this moment freaking broke my heart. In the Shibuya incident, like the majority of the deaths are throughout the series, Nanami finds himself battered and bruised, facing a swarm of mutated humans after he fought Dagon and was also burnt by Jogo. But, you know what, he's not even one to back down from all of that. Despite his injuries, his thoughts linger on Megami, Maki and Naobito, worrying about their safety amidst the chaos. Pushing forth, Nanami fights fiercely, taking down a multitude of mutated humans one by one. But. Face intervenes when Mahiso appears and offers a chilling conversation. In a surreal turn, Nanami sees his long lost friend Yu pointing towards no one other than Yuji who had also just showed up. With determination, Nanami passes the torch to Yuji saying that he's got it from here. In an instant, Mahito obliterates Nanami's upper body ending his journey in the story. Next up, 
Now, some of you are going to sit back and be like, bruh, she ain't dead. Well, I don't see her around in the series anymore, do you guys? Like, like damn, this moment always breaks me. But here you get another one of the most heartbreaking moments in all of Shonen with the apparent death of Nobara Kukasaki. So, if we all remember back to when I first mentioned that she was almost taken out by Shigemo, well, after being told to leave by Nanami there, Nobara makes a decision herself to return and do what she can to help in fighting the curses. Sadly for her, the one curse she ends up in an exchange with happens to be no one other than the ever-evolving special grade curse spirit, Mahito. Employing her ability, Nobara sends multiple nails flying, but Mahito dodges them. Using a fallen sign, Nobara gets close enough to attack Mahito's clone with her hairpin technique. Initially, it seems that Mahito has the upper hand on her, only to be shocked when Nobara's resonance ability attacks his soul directly. The damage of Nobara's attacks on the clones resonates with the original and bounces back to the clone, leaving both of them stunned. Having been caught off guard, Mahito's vulnerability allows Yuji to also launch a rush of punishing blows. To deal with this crisis, both Mahitos flee from their respective battles while forcing their enemies to follow. Suddenly, the two Mahitos run past each other in the subway hallway, not rejoining back into one like originally suspected. You see, when the two Mahitos crossed paths, it meant that Nobara would be placed up against the real Mahito, not the clone that she was originally fighting. The double rushes towards Yuji, while the original, having darted forth, touches a confused Nobara's face, who was like, by the way, just rounding a corner, so she didn't exactly know what she was running into. In the exact same moment, Yuji manages to take out a clone, but sadly, with Mahito touching our girl's face, it leaves only one possible outcome. Powerless to intervene, Yuji could only watch in horror as Nobara's life flashes before her eyes. Standing there, she tells Yuji to say to everyone that her life, it wasn't so bad. Before, sadly, her face is manipulated by Mahito's transfiguring technique, shattering her features and destroying one of her eyes. Mahito. Well, this man is something else, isn't he? He's one of those, like, kind of ho villains in the world of Jujutsu Kaisen who takes out a bunch of your favorite characters like Nanami, Nobara, or Junipei, all out while playing an extremely crucial role as a kind of, like, initial bad guy that our MC is trying to take down. I absolutely love Mahito throughout, like, this part of the story in general. He's just, like, that dude you hate for the, the sole reason of needing to hate him because you want the MC to take him down. He allied with, like, Suedo Ghetto and assembled a group of powerful curses including Jogo, Hanami, and Dagon. Together, the four of them shared a common objective, the eradication of humanity and the domination of the world by cursed spirits. Mahito really wanted to achieve his goal of obliterating humanity, and he went to great lengths to achieve it. He manipulated curses, distorted souls, and caused widespread chaos. His powers allowed him to deform and reshape his own body along with the bodies of the innocent and even the strong Jujutsu sorcerers. Mahito's actions instilled fear and posed a grave threat to the Jujutsu sorcerers and almost any civilian throughout Japan. Now, let's talk about who actually took out Mahito, because oh my lord, Gigi was a next level cuck on this one. After what is like, I, I don't know, like just straight up Yuji's greatest battle in Jujutsu Kaisen so far, where he and his brother, Big Toto, team up in the final moments of the Shibuya incident to take out Mahito. Well, towards the end of that fight, Yuji evolved into an utter beast. Man was on pure demon time, like he was full on tracking Mahito as if he was a fox across the ground as the pathetic curse spirit crawled and sprawled for his safety. In a twist of fate that no one expected, Mahito, terrified, ran to the feet of no one other than Kenjaku, or the fake Sudo Geto. Then, as Mahito cowered, asking for him to save him, Kenjaku took his opportunity to enact his true goal and killed Mahito by turning him into an orb with his curse spirit manipulation. Even though it's not clearly mentioned whether Mahito died or not, one thing's for sure is that after Kenjaku used his countrywide idol transfiguration, Mahito most likely faded away from reality. So, next up, the principal at Tokyo Jujutsu High and the man who managed to bring a freaking doll to life, Masamichi Yaga. Masamichi Yaga is one of the people who understand Gojo Satoru more than anybody else and in my eyes almost took on a fatherly role for him, being stern when he needed to be but also allowing him to grow. Yaga, a Jujutsu sorcerer with an extraordinary curse technique, found himself in a perilous situation after the Shibuya incident. The higher-ups in the Jujutsu world issued a death sentence for him, driven not only by his apparent involvement in the incident through being Ghetto and Gojo's teacher, but also by the intrigue surrounding his unique powers. 
After everyone is given their respective punishments for Shibuya, Masamichi is seen alone walking along a street when a Jujutsu higher up suddenly appears atop a light pole and confronts him, asking where he's going without any cursed corpses. Masamichi tells them that he's going to say goodbye to his son, but the higher up tells him that the only other way to save himself is if he tells them how to make independent cursed corpses. Knowing that they became more active after Gojo's sealing, Masamichi is then taken by surprise as Gakuganji off screens him in a matter of moments, leaving him laying there severely wounded. A little while later, and out of completely nowhere as Gakuganji stood above him, Masamichi then explains the process on how to create an independent cursed corpse. Confused, Gakuganji asks Masamichi why he didn't reveal this information before he was fatally wounded, and Masamichi replies that this was a curse from him to Gakuganji. A few moments later, Panda then arrives and sensing him, Gakuganji prepares for a fight but Panda ignores him and rushes towards his father, cradling his deceased body. My Zenin is Maki's twin sister, and it's because they're twins that they were belittled by everyone in the Zenin clan. Well, because they're twins and also because they're women, anyway. Twins were seen as unlucky in Jujutsu society, and there's a reason for that. My and Maki share a soul. Maki was born with heavenly restriction and more or less no cursed energy at all. And Mai, even though technically having a curse technique, could hardly make use of it because of her diminished amounts of cursed energy. Despite their oppressive upbringing, somehow, Mai, despite how often she said she hated Maki, has always held on to the belief that someday, through Maki's resilience and strength, the Zenin clan and all the suffering that came with it would be destroyed. During the perfect preparation arc, we follow Maki down into the tunnels of the Zenin clan compound. Upon entering the warehouse, Maki finds her father Ogi, awaiting her arrival. And behind him, bleeding on the floor, is Mai, calling Maki an idiot and asking why she showed up. Even now, not asking for anything from her big sister. And after making quick work of Maki, Ogi drags both girls down the hall and throws them into a pit of curses to be finished off. Maki's organs hanging out and Mai on the edge of death herself chooses this last moment to finally show her sister what's in her heart. After sinking together into what I assume is the curse realm, or the girl's innate domain, Mai explains to Maki the impossible truth of their existence, saying as long as I'm around, you Maki will never fully develop one soul in two bodies. We then witness Mai's heartbreaking sacrifice as she walks into the ocean while promising Maki that she'll take the cursed energy and everything to death with her, turning around only to leave behind one thing, a sword, whose construction would cost her the remnants of her life. When Maki's eyes open back in reality, Mai is no longer breathing, and Maki's body is no longer broken. Mai's sacrifice became Maki's awakening, a woman with absolutely zero cursed energy, no longer tied to the chains of fate. This painful moment just shows how much unwavering love Mai had for her sister. To think the person that we originally met at the beginning of the series would sacrifice herself for someone we thought she hated. Her death is, like I said, also the reason why Maki was able to complete her heavenly restriction, the first to exist after Toji Zenin. But Mai also left behind her will, a will to destroy the Zenin clan, a will that Maki carries out to perfection. Thank you Liv for taking the reins on that one and honestly everyone go and check out Liv's channel as well she does like kind of similar content to what I do with talking just about stories and all of that kind of stuff in general you know I, I just think it's great she goes over all like the light novels for Jujutsu Kaisen and deserves a lot more love if you just want to sit back and find out what happens with those. Moving forth and talking about the Zenin clan and technically right off the previous moment that uh, Liv just went over and a surprising turn of events allowed Maki to slay the cursed spirit and emerge anew thanks to her now achieving the same superhuman physical abilities as her cousin, Toji Fushiguro. Noticing the sudden disappearance of the cursed spirit, Ogi turns to then see Maki emerge from the room with Mai's body in her arms. After seeing his daughter, Ogi is immediately filled with the same dread he felt from Toji in the past. He draws his sword and activates his innate technique to fight her once again, but before he even realizes, she quickly slices his head in half and begins her forte into destroying the entire Zenin clan. So, next up on Maki's forte and to destroy the entire Zenin clan, the Kukuru unit led by Captain Nobuaki was a specialized squad within the Zenin clan. Their main duty was to enforce the clan's orders and maintain control over its members. All of the members of this squad don't have their own innate technique and are a lower branch of the Hei, which itself is a section of the Zenin household. And, also just for further information, Maki also used to be a part of this Kukuru unit. 
After dispatching her father, Maki then proceeded to take down the Kukuru squad by defeating each member individually. With precise strikes and incredible agility, she swiftly incapacitated her opponents, delivering fatal blows that left no room for mercy. The members of the Kukuru unit met a violent end, unable to withstand Maki's relentless attacks. In a matter of moments, Maki emerged victorious, leaving her battlefield stewing with fallen foes. They say your arrogance is the key to your demise, and it's certainly true in this man called Chojuro Zenin's case, as he seemed pretty overconfident while fighting Maki. His curse technique is called Earth Arms, which is dope, and it's kind of like Toph from Avatar. It allows him to manipulate the Earth's terrain to some degree. In his battle with Maki, she proved to be a bit too much of a foe though, and in one swift move, she tore out Chojuro's throat, permanently silencing the old fool. The Zenin family part of the story, as I've just gone over beforehand, has garnered significant hype and for good reason. They were a force to be reckoned with and one of the big three families throughout Jujutsu Kaisen. But within a few hours, probably not even hours, within a few minutes, that all changes. Among the formidable members of the family, Jinichi Zenin was no exception. His curse technique allows him to make giant fists propelled by curse energy like a missile. When the news of Ogi Zenin's demise reached Jinichi, he made the ill-fated decision to confront Maki along with the other members of the Hei. As anticipated, this proved to be the greatest mistake of his life. In a display of her formidable prowess, Maki swiftly demolished Jinichi, standing atop his massive fist and delivering a decisive blow that left no room for escape. Next up, we've got Ranta Zenin, another member of the Zenin family's elite unit, who showed some potential as a semi-grade 1 sorcerer. Throughout Maki's destruction of the Zenin clan household, Ranta eagerly jumped into action to fight against her. He tried to hold her down using his paralyzing curse technique where he can immobilize anyone he looks at. But, oh boy, Maki effortlessly broke through his curse technique with sheer brute force. Poor Ranta like, could not handle the heat at all, and as his strength started to disappear, his curse technique put a lot of strain on his eyes, causing him to go blind. Tragically, as he used up more of his energy, his strength waned, and due to him losing his sight, Ranta ended up dying, falling to the ground, thinking that they won. Ah, so we've got everyone's favourite, Naoya Zenin. Man, Naoya thought he was hot stuff, but guess what? His arrogance just got a one-way ticket to the afterlife. Or should I say m misogyny? It's definitely more misogyny than arrogance. He's got a, he's got a bit of both peppered in there. And I'll just say that to, to piss off a few of the Tate lovers out there, eh? Go super saiyan in front of a waterfall or something. It's fucking hilarious. Well, I guess he did have reasons to slightly be arrogant after all. Because he is a special grade 1 sorcerer. And he did inherit the projection sorcery of Naobito. Maki, fueled by vengeance though, and a taste for justice, decided to serve Naoya a hefty portion of humble pie for the first time in his life. As Naoya's fancy projection sorcery attacks failed to save his sorry behind, Maki dodged each and every one gracefully and successfully while proceeding to beat down on him like every other member of the clan so far. However, Maki wasn't the only one who finished him off. In fact, in a huge roundabout way to a moment earlier on in the series, it was actually Mai and Maki's mother who stabbed him in the back as he tried to crawl away to safety. But he didn't die that easily, like you literally have to expect people like Naoya and Shigemo to survive multiple near-death experiences. Flashing into the moments that happened inside of the Sakurajima colony now, which is way up into this culling game saga, it's shown that he eventually became a cursed womb, who, for a short time, managed to overpower Maki with his speed. However, Maki, with the help of these random culling game members who show up and lend her a hand, Maki eventually defeats him again, even after his domain expansion was used. Obviously, this is because like Toji, when, you know, good old Naoya brought up his domain there, Maki is seen as like a building-like object because of her lack of curse energy. So, it never even knew she was inside of the domain, and she was just able to walk around freely like she owned the place. Naoya, like every other helpless Naoya fam, attempted to call Maki a Toji imposter when this did happen, but before he was able to finish his sentence, he was destroyed by her finishing blow. Like the rest of the Zenin clan, Maki and Mai's mum hated them, but it was mainly because they didn't follow the clan's ways. At some point in the past, she did truly love them. Back before every Zenin death that we just went over before happened though, she tried to stop Maki from reaching Mai, but Maki just didn't listen to her and continued forth. When Maki finally does defeat Naoya, she goes back to their household and sees her mother scared in the kitchen. Maki asks their mother why she asked her to come back, like referring to before. As her mother doesn't answer, Maki continues to walk forth and seemingly cuts her down. However, she didn't die instantly. As mentioned before, she was the one who eventually finished off Naoya, and it was there on his back that she eventually succumbed to her wounds.
Harry, Harai, Chizuru, I don't know how to say his name properly, simply known as one of the participants of the culling game, is aligned with Reggie Star's group. After failed negotiations with Megami early on in the game, Chizuru attacked him but was swiftly thrown off the building and slammed into the crowd by Noe. Despite the setback, Chizuru managed to survive and even climbed back up to face Megami once more inside an apartment. Chizuru's second attempt ended in defeat as he was once again thrown off the building. Tragically, he suffered a fatal stare by Megami upon landing on the ground as well, resulting in his untimely demise. Speaking of Reggie Star, Reggie was one of the first major antagonists we were introduced to at the start of the culling game. Unlike some of the characters, we didn't get much of a backstory on Reggie. Although it's clear he had a prior relationship with Kenjaku and was acquainted with him well enough to know the brain clearly had ulterior motives with this death game. Reggie proves that he's an OG sorcerer by having a pure-blooded, con artist, and trickery-based sorcery battle with Fushiguro Megami. In a fight based around who can deceive the other better, Reggie's curse technique, contractual recreation, is perfect for that. When burning some kind of proof of purchase, like a receipt or transaction certificate, Reggie can bring whatever was written on the contract into existence. He uses this to recreate simple things like a stalk of Daikon or two literal Mack trucks on maximum overdrive acceleration. In the end though, Reggie was bested by Megami who managed to create his first full domain expansion by using the walls in the gymnasium the fight takes place in. Both brought to complete exhaustion, Reggie is taken by surprise by Megami's divine dog totality losing a pretty large chunk of his body in the attack which ends up bringing him to defeat. As Reggie lies, awaiting the end, he makes good on his promise to Megami and transfers his 41 points onto him. Reggie's one final request is for Megami to continue being a fool and let fate toy with him until he dies. And yeah, I think it's fair to say Reggie wasn't too far off from the truth. Kurorushi, a very similar being in nature to the grasshopper curse, is the manifested insectoid apparition representing Japan's fear of cockroaches. It runs entirely on instinct, a terrifying and ancient force of the swarm of flying cockroaches that will devour anything alive. Kurorushi asexually reproduces 24-7, which leads to this constant, insatiable appetite for the taste of iron. This hellish creature meets its bloody end when Yuta gives him a mind-blowing kiss, the silver-tongued devil he is. But while this seemed dire at the time, Kuro was revealed to have survived this ordeal when he showed up uninvited to the Triple Domain expansion. We found out that he can't die unless all of his cockroach subordinates are killed, which makes him effectively immortal since he probably always keeps one or two hidden away underground. But this entry isn't null and void because thousands to millions of bugs did die, and these are technically separate incarnations of the bug man, which implies that he was killed in some way even if he came back and probably will again. If I wanted to get real technical about these bugs, I could have talked about all the fly heads we've seen get vaporized throughout the series as well, but I think I've spoken enough about JJK's creepy crawlies. So what's up next? Let's go back to Diavolo. By the way, thank you to Big No Operator and Jellomoth for taking those two there. Their, you know, channels will be linked down, everyone's channels will be linked down below. Anyway, moving forth, we've got Yorazu, who was another of the reincarnated sorceress from over a thousand years ago. There, they obviously made a deal with Kenjaku to take part in this massive death battle. Sadly for Megami, the body that was chosen for her revival just happened to be his sister, Sukumi's. I, I don't know, can you can you specifically choose bodies? I can't remember if you could, because did Kinjaku specifically choose her? I don't know, I'd like you guys to let me know down in the comment section below if that is possible. By the way, in the past, she was a powerful sorcerer, but had an untimely death because she was simping too hard on Sukuna. In the present, she's back at it again and stronger than ever. Now, she proposed to Sukuna that if she defeats him, they'll get married. Her curse technique is actually construction, where she could recreate any substance she recognized, just like Mai's, but a thousand times better. Turns out, love wasn't really for her, as in the end, she was again defeated by Sukuna in an almost identical fashion to the past. Even still, that made her happy, and she passed on with a smile on her face. Last, but like definitely not actually the last, like I'm gonna have to redo this video for a third time now as I did like a year and a half ago, but this man has the highest curse energy output in the history of sorcery fight, the gold Ryu Ishigori. 
Throughout the Culling Games saga, he fought a three-way battle against Yuta Akatsu and Takako Uro. It was honestly probably one of the best fights in Jujutsu Kaisen, where they went all out and three of them activated their domain expansion simultaneously. It was just beautiful. He though was eventually defeated by Yuta, but he managed to survive that part of the colony and sort of became friends with Yuta towards the end of it. I liked their little sit-down chat they had. That there is until he met Sukuna. Yes, after taking out Yorizu and in preparation to take out Gojo, Sukuna decided to slow things down and take out one of the most beloved culling game entrants. Having felt a tremendous flare of curse energy, Ryu prepares himself for the force that awaited him. Surprisingly, after Sukuna showed up and actually slashed him across the chest, Ryu managed to survive the first one and even prepared to shoot off his own ability. However, before he was able to shoot, Sukuna darted forth and triple sliced his face up. Watch. Yeah, man got done. I was, I was so sad when I saw Ryu go here. I was like, damn, I wish he had like reverse curse technique or something so he could come back because he was such a cool character and I really liked how his character like communicated with Yuta a lot throughout their arc. Either way, if you guys have enjoyed this video, do make sure you go down into the description and check out all of the other channels and the people who have like jumped on this video as it's a lot of work just recording a tiny little section for a video like this and then sending it over to me. It might not seem like a lot, but it's, you know, taken out of everyone's day when they've got like jobs and all that kind of stuff to do. So it does mean a lot. Make sure you go check them out. And if you do want more stuff like this, what other series that I'll go and try and get other YouTubers from different series and all that kind of stuff, then let me know down below. And if you are new around here and just want to keep up to date with like massive explain videos that I usually do, then make sure to subscribe. Again, thanks to Ray for sponsoring this video. Make sure you click my link down below to like jam out and get a bunch of goodies and whatnot. But either way, for now it's been your professional degenerate, Diavolo, and I'll see you all in a bit. Bye.